For the latest news and updates on Tibet, subscribe to Yalun YouTube channel. And don't forget to click the notification bell icon. And we've just been talking about the sign of Tibetan dialogue, and I know that that dialogue had, at one time was quite robust. In terms of my own readings, there was about nine different rounds of meetings between 2002 and 2010, and then an abrupt stop. And since 2010, the positions have hardened, the dialogue has ceased, uh, and under President uh, Premier Xi, we know that it is hardened even further. Uh, can you tell us why is it important to address the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, and a little bit more about the Middle Way, because everything I hear about the Middle Way reminds me of simply things that remind me of the Canadian Federation, and what we give to provinces over control over certain jurisdictions, and yet it is constantly portrayed in terms of propaganda exercises by the Chinese Communist Party as some sort of independence revolutionary movement. I do not think it is that, but can you address that, Sikyong, about the nature of the Middle Way approach and what is meant to be achieved under the Sino-Tibetan dialogue? Uh, if the, uh, with the permission of the Chair, I would like to take a little more time on this because this is one of the most important uh, issues that concerns us, the Sino, the uh, Tibet uh, conflict. Um, since 2010, there have been no traction whatsoever from the Chinese side. They stopped uh, because uh, the reason why, now on hindsight, we know for a fact that the reason why they wanted to resume uh, start dialogue in 2002 was mainly to see that Tibetans don't protest the coming out party of China, that is the 2008 Olympics. So therefore the dialogue went on for some time, but there was no concrete result out of that. And since 2010, it stopped. Uh, therefore, uh, as you all know, I uh, took over the responsibility of Sikong on May 27th last year, and there was pandemic, and I could not travel. Uh, to other countries except for Italy and Switzerland last November. And this time before coming here, we had a series of uh, one uh, roundtable meeting with our friends in Europe to understand the situation, the current situation in Ukraine, post-Ukraine uh, implications to the world and new world order that might emerge and, cons uh, and see how Europeans would look at uh, China uh, under those circumstances. Uh, so it was quite educating for me, and then I went on to have uh, uh, meetings, because this time I visited the United States on the invitation of Speaker Pelosi, and we have had series of meetings with Under Secretary uh, Azra Zaya, uh, who was appointed by the Biden administration not even one year into coming, coming into office. Uh, at the level of undersecretary, because under Obama administration is for undersecretary, then it went down to assistant secretary during Trump administration. Now it's elevated back, back to undersecretary, and uh, she will be very soon visiting Dharamsala after my return to Dharamsala and meet with His Holiness and see how our administration works. She also helped organize. Uh, uh, roundtable meeting with ambassadors where the Canadian chief of uh, deputy chief of mission was also present because the idea was to see how like-minded countries can come together uh, on the dialogue uh, uh, resumption of dialogue and uh, then uh, we also met with Kurt Campbell uh, of the National Security Council uh, uh, responsible for Indo-Pacific and, and we had a series of meetings in the Congress including a very long meeting with Speaker Pelosi and uh, ranking members of both House Foreign Affairs Committee and Senate Foreign, Relations, Foreign Relations Committee. Now, uh, we uh, feel that there should be a change in the narrative because Chinese propaganda and narrative is so strong that they make it uh, believe as if Tibet has been part of China since time immemorial. And they have the manpower and the resources to do that and uh, people don't study about Tibetan history but I would like to uh, uh, note that this book or the Tibet 20, Tibet Brief 2020 written by Michael Van Wall Van Prak his, uh, uh, his last assignment was a professor at Stanford and his uh, uh, expert on international law and uh, on the uh, uh, history of Tibet so unfortunately most of the sources of information for the Western world regarding the history of uh, Asia comes from China, particularly East, East Asia comes from Chinese sources. What he did in this book over the last 10 years, working with about 70 experts from inner Asia, not just China, but Japan, Russia, Mongolia, uh, uh, Uyghur, uh, and Central Asian countries, he concludes 
that whether it's to do with the Mongolian order. And when he says Mongolian order, our relation uh, with China has been there uh, from 7th to 9th century. And at that time, Tibet was a big empire, having conquered uh, the Chinese capital, Xi'an, those days, and up to Samarkand in Uzbekistan today. So Tibet was a big empire. Then we had 400 years of disintegration. And during those periods, we had relations with the Mongols from 1220 onwards. And so I won't go too much in, into history, because uh, uh, this book says that whether it's according to the Mongolian order or the Chinese order or the Manchu order or the Tibetan order or as per international law today, Tibet has never been considered part of China. Uh, then we have another book written by a Chinese professor called Professor Lao Han Tin, who is also now based in San Diego. He was a professor of uh, the City University of uh, Hong Kong. And he studied the Manchu period. His, his study was based on the historical imperial records of the Manchus that says that Manchus never considered Tibet as part of China. So uh, therefore, uh, Chinese narrative to the international community is misleading. And uh, now it is important that uh, the countries recognize the historical independent status of Tibet by that, I do not mean to say that we are going to change our position from middle way approach to independence. But when countries say that uh, Tibet is part of PRC, then you are going against international law because the one agreement that we have with China is the 1951 17-point agreement that was signed under duress after the invasion of Tibet in 1950, and that is illegal and unfair. So. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, when you say Tibet is part of PRC, then you are telling the Chinese government you can do whatever you inside do uh, uh, with Tibet, inside Tibet, and we will not interfere in whatever you do. Uh, on the other hand, countries also support negotiation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama's representative or CTA leadership with the Chinese government. And we find this a contradiction because there is no leverage for the middle way approach. To con people don't realize that His Holiness has climbed down from independence to the middle way approach, uh, which is seeking autonomy for Tibet, uh, for the Tibetan people to be able, able to preserve their language, culture, religion, way of life, and their environment, which is also very important, not only for the Tibetans, but uh, to the whole region. Therefore, we urge the governments uh, to change their position if possible, and if it is not possible, please do not repeat this statement that Tibet is part of PRC. When you do that, then you are kowtowing to the Chinese. You are listening to the command of the Chinese, and China respects only strength, not weakness. If countries want to be the pony, they'll write you again and again. They'll write you again and again, and they will not respect you at all. If you are able to stand up, uh, and I, I, I request you to read this book, and the, the translation of the Chinese version will also be coming out soon. And these are latest books. Not, we are not talking about Tibetans. This His Holiness has always said that uh, uh, when Chinese put this precondition that His Holiness should say Tibet is part of uh, People's Republic of China, they also put the precondition that His Holiness should say Taiwan is part of China. And His Holiness uh, cannot represent the Taiwanese people. And His Holiness said uh, uh, this uh, uh, answer that I'm not a historian. Let us leave history to historians. And this is what historians are talking about, the history of Tibet. But His Holiness is very pragmatic and we look at the reality of the situation inside Tibet and for me, for us, what is more important is the preservation of the very identity of the Tibetan people. Therefore, I urge governments, particularly Canadian government, not to repeat the statement that Tibet is part of PRC, kowtowing to the Chinese government. Thank you.